Welcome back to Public Speaking. Today is our first of two lectures on Chapter 1 of your class textbook. We're going to be speaking about anxiety and communication apprehension today. Let's dive right in. What you see here is the encyclopedic entry for communication anxiety and uncertainty according to the Encyclopedia of Communication Theory. It states that anxiety refers to affective feelings, such as uneasiness, awkwardness, confusion, stress, or apprehensiveness about what might occur in the encounter. So already we can make two observations about communication apprehension or anxiety, two terms that we'll be using interchangeably during today's lecture. By affective, the entry means that the effects of communication apprehension deliberately influence our emotions. And by about what might occur in the encounter, communication apprehension affects us not just during moments of severe stress or anxiety, but prior to. The entry continues. Uncertainty, on the other hand, is a cognitive phenomenon and involves both predictive uncertainty and explanatory uncertainty, which means that it also affects our intellect. While predictive uncertainty refers to our inability to predict strangers' attitudes or behaviors, explanatory uncertainty refers to our inability to come up with a coherent explanation for strangers' unfamiliar behaviors. In addition, as individuals navigate across cultural boundaries, they have minimum and maximum thresholds for tolerating anxiety and uncertainty. So, in a nutshell, what this entry tells us is that communication apprehension affects us both before and after moments of severe stress, and it affects both our emotions and our minds. So, let's discuss some of the other symptoms related to communication apprehension. These are threefold. First are physical symptoms, which are reflexive or involuntary responses. These are fight-or-flight instincts that we have whenever we encounter especially stressful situations. you probably experienced some of these things before, even if you've never engaged in public speaking. If you've ever gone on a first aid or had to meet a stranger for the first time, perhaps gone on a job interview, you might have had butterflies in your stomach, sweaty palms, or other involuntary responses to being nervous. In fact, not even being able to read the actual words in front of you is an example of a physical symptom of communication apprehension. In Oomph Magazine, Mikhail Cho writes, Even your pupils dilate, which makes it hard to read anything up close, like presenter notes, but improves long-range visibility, making you more aware of your audience's facial expressions. So, if you're reading between the lines, what Mikhail Cho is trying to say is that the fight-or-flight instincts that we have from physical responses go all the way back to our ancestors that were worried about whether or not saber-toothed tigers on the savanna were going to eat them, which is why you can see at long distances at your, as your pupils dilate, but can't see very well up close. This same thing affects people during moments of public speaking, when we can't read the notes on our index cards in front of our faces, but in the same breath we can see the glowers or the expressions of people in the back row. Alongside physical symptoms are intellectual symptoms, or breakdowns in mental processes. This affects not just being able to misremember certain aspects of what we're going to say next, it also affects our memory itself. So, if you've ever been in a situation where you were introduced to someone for the first time and then immediately forgot their name, that's an illustration of an intellectual symptom of communication apprehension. But it can also affect your prowess, or whether or not you think you're going to be able to perform in a successful way during a communication circumstance. Laurence Olivier, probably one of the most foremost actors of the 20th century, actually experienced an intellectual breakdown at the height of his career. In the day Laurence Olivier got stage fright, acclaimed director Michael Blakemore writes, at 64 he, that's Olivier, was a few months away from the exact age of his character James Tyrone and learning lines and retaining them often becomes a problem for older actors. In his case, this was complicated by a crisis of confidence that had come 
out of nowhere during a run of Othello. He was now the most famous stage actor in the world, and he suddenly buckled under the weight of explanation that this reputation had placed on him. So in other words, what Blake Moore is saying is that Olivier had no real reason to have a crisis of confidence, and yet he had trouble misremembering his lines even though he was perfectly cast because he was the same age as the role he would be performing. Blake Moore continues at the bottom. By the last week of rehearsals, the performances were in place and only wanted on the presence of an audience. Larry now had a grip on his lines, but still obsessively ran those parts of the play about which he felt unsure, particularly in the mammoth fourth act. Watching him, I had to remain completely still, since if I made the slightest movement, or shifted in my seat or crossed my legs, it would deflect his attention. The lines would go, and he would shout for a prompt. The fact that he had now achieved his performance, that rehearsals had gone supremely well, that the word was already out that the National was about to return to form, didn't seem to comfort him at all. So notice that the intellectual symptoms that Olivier was exhibiting is a block, a mental block, an incapacity to realize that he had achieved all of his goals. Finally, We'll talk about emotional symptoms. Now, we'll draw out emotional symptoms a bit later on, but in brief, an emotional symptom of communication apprehension typically manifests by immature responses to our obstacles, whether those obstacles be the, the tremendously difficult relationships involved in a first date, or whether it involves sharing our most important beliefs and values at a public forum. In fact, Stephen Fry, who was recorded in Stage Fright and How to Avoid It, writes, This is what it must be like to give birth, wrote Olivier, of his own experiences. But actually, it's more like dying. According to one medical study, the stress an actor experiences during performance can equal that of a small car crash. Performers often use language more appropriate to war, of knocking an audience dead, slaying in the aisle. Every time I went on stage, there was that heavy feeling, Fry said. I felt the audience was not on my side from the get-go. Notice that while Fry isn't citing that encyclopedic record that we mentioned earlier, he is absolutely speaking about the predictive element of communication apprehension, of feeling as if he's going to fail because he felt the audience wasn't going to be on his side. The article continues. Up to 50% of performers experience stage fright to some extent. It's the old fight-or-flight syndrome, says Dr. Glenn Wilson, visiting professor of psychology at Gresham College. Today, making a fool of yourself in front of an audience might have consequences that are almost as bad as being chomped by a saber-toothed tiger. Again, Glenn Wilson isn't necessarily referring to those physical symptoms that Mikhail Cho mentioned in the magazine, but they're absolutely aligned in context. And it's not just actors. Musicians are particularly susceptible. In a 1986 survey, 27% of orchestral players admitted taking beta blockers to combat its effects, a figure that is now believed to be have increased. What's really interesting, says Wilson, is why so many people are susceptible to stage flight and nevertheless go into the performing arts. It's as if they want or need to confront it. So as I said, we're going to elaborate on the emotional symptoms of communication apprehension by looking at the causes of communication anxiety, which are threefold. And those three phases are alarm, resistance, and finally exhaustion. Stage one, or alarm, is that fight or flight instinct that we've already spoken about. Imagine walking into a restaurant and finding the only booth adjacent to your ex. You would immediately either insist that it's all right and you're going to sit down anyway, or you suddenly decide you're not as hungry as you thought you were, regardless of whether or no you had eaten in the last 36 hours. That's fight or flight. In other words, what you're trying to do is resistance. You're trying to control the situation or circumstance instead of the one thing you can control, which is your response your intellectual, emotional, and physical response to an adverse or stressful situation. 
Typically, whenever we resist in inappropriate or immature ways, we demonstrate poor control, which can have long-lasting, sometimes disastrous effects on our behavioral patterns. I have a dear friend who is a psychiatrist at the Veterans Hospital. He deals with lots of individuals that have suffered from PTSD and try to resist those circumstances by not necessarily controlling their responses, but instead by controlling things like how much alcohol they consume, how much they eat or how much they don't eat, and whether or not they take too many controlled substances. And this can eventually lead to stage three, exhaustion, or what communication theorist James McCroskey calls awfulizing. Think back. Have you ever procrastinated in a particularly difficult class in high school or college? You failed to study for that math exam, or you waited until the last minute to start that ten-page essay? Well, that's an excellent example of poor resistance or poor control. Now think back again. After failing to study for that exam or working on that essay sufficiently early, did you then do the exact same thing over again? Chances are, if you did, what you really contributed to was the own awfulizing of your experience. You made a bad situation worse, so that the last time, or rather the next time you returned to a similar, similar or comparable situation, you felt like you had to do the exact same thing even more to distract yourself from a resistive or stressful situation or circumstance. Let's take a look at an illustration of that, and probably the best is the Stanford Marshmallow Experiment. In this landmark study, which had over 600 participants, maturity and emotional responses to stress were carefully measured. So as you carefully watch excerpts from this study, I'd like you to identify ways maturity can contribute to the success or failure of the experiment's participants. Okay, so here's the deal. There's a marshmallow. You can either wait, and I'll bring you back another one, so you can have two, or you can eat it now. So you can eat it now, or you can wait, and I'll bring you back two. Okay? Okay, I'll be back. Okay, so I have one marshmallow for each of you. And here's the deal. You can either eat it now, or you can wait till I get back, and you can have two. Okay? So eat it now, or wait till I get back, and you can have two. Okay, so I have this marshmallow, and you can eat it 
going to look for some more, but you sit here, and if you haven't eaten that one, I'll bring you back another one, okay? I'll be right back. couple of observations I'd like to make about that video. Number one is that we can clearly see how a bad situation, or at least a stressful situation, can be made worse by the way we handle it, both intellectually and emotionally. Walter Michel, the original propagator of this experiment, said people experience willpower fatigue and plain old fatigue and exhaustion. Note, even though He's not speaking about James McCroskey, he absolutely is, awfulizing, exhaustion. What we do when we get tired is heavily influenced by the self-standards we develop, that in turn is strongly influenced by the models we have. I've worked hard all day, now I'm entitled to X, Y, or Z. Confusion about these kinds of behaviors, tremendous willpower in one situation, but not another, is erased when you realize self-control involves cognitive schools. In other words, it's very difficult to respond to both apprehension and stressful situations. So that's why we have to plan ahead. It's why you should never go grocery shopping when you're hungry, because whenever you make decisions based upon hunger instead of reason, your grocery cart ends up being filled with too much food and oftentimes the wrong kind of food. Michelle continues, You can have the skills and not use them. If your kid waits for the marshmallow, then they're able to do it. But if they don't, you don't know why. They may have decided they just don't want to. So, if the causes of a lot of our problems related to communication apprehension are related to our inability to plan ahead, then let's talk in more depth about where anxiety comes from so that we can have a better understanding about how to overcome it. So, this is a quotation by James McCroskey. As I read through this quotation, try to answer this question. According to James McCroskey, who should you blame if you have communication apprehension? McCroskey says, we view trait communication apprehension principally as individuals' expression of inborn biological characteristics that are antecedent to social experience and, like many other personality traits, do not depend primarily on learning processes. As such, individual differences in communication apprehension are mostly traceable to differences in biological functioning. So if you guess that James McCroskey says you should blame your parents if you have communication apprehension, you're right. Because our communication apprehension, like so many of our personality traits, are inborn. They're biological. We inherit them from previous generations. So the good news is, is that if you have communication anxiety, it's inborn. If you had a high school English teacher or a speech teacher, that try to yo to you by saying, you must unlearn what you have learned. You've just learned to be apprehensive. That person was a filthy liar. You can disregard what they said. But here's the bad news. In the literally tens of thousands of samples that McCroskey analyzed during his years as a communication theorist, he never encountered any single instance of communication apprehension that was so egregious, so tremendously overwhelming, 
that it couldn't be at least managed if not outright overcome. So the bad news is, if you do have communication apprehension, you have an obligation to overcome it. Not just because we have an obligation to share our most important values, beliefs, ideas, and arguments in public forums, but also because even if I'm bad at math, the IRS still expects me to turn in a W-2 or a 1040-EZ every year. The same as you in living with a free society and being compelled or responsible for sharing important ideas in public forums. So then, what's the difference between anxiety and fear? Because I think understanding that difference will help us better manage our anxieties and apprehensions. Anxiety and fear are two words that we often use interchangeably in everyday speech, but in regards to communication apprehension, fear exhibits an object, an object that's easily overcome because it's often concrete. Or as Thomas Hardy says, fear is the mother of foresight. You can plan ahead for a fear. I am afraid of mowing my lawn. I only have two neighbors on either side, so I have an extra big yard. It takes at least 90 minutes to mow my lawn. And, in addition, I have at least two or three different parts to my lawn. I have really bad allergies, and sometimes it rains, and it takes an extra long time because I have to bag all the wet grass so it doesn't mulch. But I have anxieties about death. Now, I know what death is from an intellectual perspective. To be frank, I've even been in the same room as some of my dearest loved ones have died. But I've never experienced death myself. A absence of a clear object is what produces anxiety. So the secret, oftentimes, to managing our apprehensions is to make more concrete or realized what it is about those anxieties that's causing us such stress. And that all begins by forming what's called a tactical response plan planning ahead, being just as predictive in how we prepare for apprehensive situations as we would anything else. One of the best ways to do that is, if we anticipate an apprehension or anxiety, create a hierarchy of task-oriented behavior, things that you can do almost as instinctively as our alarms or our resistance. For example, a student came to me several years ago, saying, I have three things to do for my next speech, and I don't know what one to do first. I need to rewrite my introduction, because it, it just doesn't make sense with the context of my thesis. I need to rewrite a joke between transition two or three, and I also need to completely rework my thesis so it'll be a lot more clear. Well, I advise that student to rewrite their thesis first, not because the thesis is the most important part of a person's proposition or composition. No, I did that because if they change their thesis enough, I advise them they might not have to change their introduction or transition. Or at the very least, what if they rewrote their transitions or their introductions and then found out after creating a more clear thesis they had to rewrite them all over again? Creating a hierarchy of task-oriented behavior as part of a larger tactical response plan is all about working smart, not working hard, and exercising your reason so that you don't become overwhelmed by your emotions. Alongside that is something called systemic desensitization. Systemic desensitization is the equivalent of dipping your toe at the shallow end of a pool instead of jumping off the high dive if you're afraid of water. Let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. Okay, that's enough of that. What you just saw was my greatest apprehension when I was approximately five years old. It was fats. Fats, the six-foot-tall gorilla from Showbiz Pizza. If you've ever played any games from the Five Nights at Freddy series, you now know what some of the inspirations were for its characters. Fats was a gigantic robotic gorilla. Can you imagine? This is the way that people tried to entertain children in the late 1980s and the early 1990s, and I was terrified of Fats. But my mother wanted me to have my sixth birthday party at Showbiz Pizza even though I decried that it was a complete disaster and, and we were all doomed to die 
So one day she picked me up from school and she said, we're going to showbiz pizza today. And we're not going to go into the theater. We're just going to play ski ball and I'll even buy you a soda. So because of that, I said, as long as we parked in handicap parking so that if anything went down, we could be out the door and in the car and down the road, I agreed. A few weeks later, she said, this time we're going to go in the back of the theater. And I said, as only as long as there are at least five or ten other people in the theater. And we can sit in the very back. That way, if Fats comes off the stage, he'll eat the people in front first. And maybe, just maybe, we can run fast enough to escape. Several weeks and even months passed. Eventually, we got closer and closer and closer, till eventually I was able to have my sixth birthday party at Showbiz Pizza, all because of systemic desensitization. Systemic desensitization is slowly acclimating yourself to stressful situations in low-stakes settings, and it's as effective for communication apprehension as it is for gigantic robotic gorillas. This is another quotation from James McCroskey. He says, The consistency of the findings of this research permits fairly clear conclusions. In studies where the subjects receiving SD, that's an acronym for synthesis, systemic desensitization, and the control subjects were a part of the same course, the type of intervention produced a different change index. This was true in control group situations where the instructor was the same across interventions. So they're teaching two kinds of classes to students, one in which students had low stakes environments to give speeches, and other environments in which they were just given instructions on how to overcome communication apprehension. And the results were that the use of SD alone is a better way of helping individuals overcome high communication apprehension. Communication courses, with or without skills experience, make only a marginally positive contribution to reducing CA. In other words, it's a good thing that you're taking a course at Rose State where we compel you to give speeches and teach you about overcoming communication apprehension. But if you weren't taking this course, according to James McCroskey, it would be better if you just threw yourself into the deep end and started giving speeches, as opposed to just reading about or listening about how to overcome anxiety in communication settings. Speaking and articulation exercises can also help you tremendously with overcoming communication apprehension. One of the things that I like to do when I'm working on a new presentation is stick a pen or a sturdy pencil about two or three teeth back in my mouth. You know, one of the most prevalent symptoms, physical symptoms, involuntary symptoms of communication apprehension is garbling our words, mumbling and speaking too fast. And articulation exercises help you overcome both of these by opening your mouth more, because the more clearly you're understood, the less likely it is you're going to see any glowers in your audience, and that can reduce your overall anxiety levels, but also it forces you to slow down when you speak, to breathe more slowly, which can relax you, and also reduce your apprehensions. And finally, it goes without saying, but I'll say it anyway, don't forget to reward yourself for overcoming communication apprehension. Now, I need to qualify that. Whenever you do reward yourself, it's always a good idea to reward yourself in incremental ways. So instead of promising you're seeing yourself a trip to Disney World if you get an A this term in all of your classes, give yourself tiny rewards after small junctures of achievement. If you study for 90 minutes, or if you work on a speech composition for at least 30 to 45 minutes, then tell yourself you're going to let yourself watch your favorite episode of Rick or Morty, or check your favorite YouTube channel for updates. Spend a few minutes on Facebook, maybe even give yourself a mocha choca latte whatever at five bucks. Because by giving yourself those smaller incremental rewards, you're de awfulizing a stressful process, which means you'll be far more willing or likely to return to that process in a more or less stressful way in the future. Well, that's all I've got for our presentation today, but I just want to remind you to make sure that you complete both Discussion Journal Entry 3 and Chapter 1 Quiz in relationship to this lecture. In the meantime, feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions.